It's my pleasure to make it for our speaker for today's seminar, Dr. Marianne Wong. Um, who is the deputy member of the National for Science and Council and the Chief Research uh, Officer at uh, IWF and Labs? Uh, Dr. Walk joined IWF in 2019 after spending 13 years at the DNF and Labs, uh, completing her service there as a general of high school for both at the House California Laboratory and the Energy and Climate Program. Uh, she is also the vice chair for Idaho's uh, Higher Education Research Council and the president chair of the National Laboratory uh, Chief Research uh, Officer. She serves on several advisory boards for universities and National Lab and Technical Institute. In 2021, uh, she uh, was named one of the top 100 women in energy by the National Diversity Council. Uh, Dr. Walk earned her uh, doctorate and master's degree in geophysics from Caltech um, and a bachelor's degree in geology and physics from OCA. She is a member of ANS, among many other uh, professional societies. So, with this, I'm going to speak with both of you, but first, let's welcome our speaker. Well, thank you, Yusri, for that kind introduction, and I appreciate it. Uh, and as you heard, I'm actually a geophysicist, not a nuclear engineer. So you might keep that in mind when you ask me, don't ask me detailed technical questions about reactor design. So, and I'll, I'll get into a little bit about what my job is at Idaho National Lab as we move forward. But what I want to do today is give you a grand tour of what Idaho National Laboratory is about from a strategy perspective and what we're doing technically, what our vision is and, and how we're moving forward. And so we're, we want to focus certainly on nuclear energy and then also integrated energy systems for our low carbon energy future for the nation. I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about the National Laboratory System very quickly, focus in on INL and then go into what we do. So our the National Lab System, you can see here on the slide, it consists of 17 different National Laboratories scattered across the country. Uh, there are several in this region, Savannah River Oak Ridge, uh, Jefferson National Accelerator Facility is also pretty close to you here in North Carolina. We are way out west in Idaho. Do I have a, I do. There we are, Eastern Idaho. And I'll show another slide that shows where that is um, specifically and the very large amount of real estate that we have out there. Which And why would they put in a laboratory, a national laboratory in Idaho, one might ask. Well, there is a piece of federal land out there, which I'll talk about in a minute, which was used during World War II to test Navy ordnance. And after the nuclear revolution came and nuclear power and weapons started being developed specifically for nuclear power purposes, INL became the National Reactor Testing Station in 1949. And that's, and there was lots of real estate out there, which you'll be able to see, I hope, in a few minutes. So this, slide shows a little bit about how the Department of Energy and National Laboratories fit into the spectrum of science and technology, what types of laboratories we have. There are, as I said, 17. We have 10 that are operated by the Department of Energy's Office of Science, which is more than $7 billion agency. And a lot of that has to do with operating large research facilities, things like light sources and neutron sources at our multi-program labs like Brookhaven, Berkeley, Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Pacific Northwest. We also have three uh, national security laboratories, Sandia, Los Alamos, and Livermore. Over here, they represent more, tilted more towards the technology side than the science side. And Boratone National Security, very multi-program. Those are the three largest laboratories in the system by far. We have single program science labs, mostly things are related to high energy physics like Fermi Lab, Princeton Plasma Physics Lab is um, devoted to fusion energy. And then we have uh, multi-program energy technology labs, and that is what, where INL sits. We are the nuclear energy lab. We're, we're operated for 
the Department of Energy Office of Nuclear Energy. And then there's also NREL National Nuclear National, excuse me, National Renewable Energy Lab operated by the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy part of the community. And then NETL, the National Energy Technology Lab, is operated by Fossil Energy and Carbon Management part of DOE. So we've got this entire spectrum going from fundamental science to more applied technology. INL fits more on the applied technology end of the spectrum, but we do do some fundamental science as well. And the entire national laboratory system employs more than 60,000 people, and about half of those are scientists and engineers. And so th this is a really a quite, in my view, a very viable career path for young graduates of uh, various graduate programs like here at North Carolina State to consider um, a career in a national laboratory system. It's been it certainly worked out well for me. So let's go on to INL. Uh, our vision is very simple. We want to change the world's energy future and secure its critical infrastructure. And we want to do that using technologies that are fundamentally focused on nuclear, but also on other clean energy options. And then we have a a, a way to make those things secure through our critical infrastructure work. And this slide also shows the uh, values that we have at the laboratory, which were heavy on teamwork and was recently added inclusivity, which I think was an important add for us. On this slide, you can see various reasons why we need a clean energy future, things like forest fires, um, you know, power outages, pipeline infrastructure attacks, that's the one here, the colonial pipeline attack and even the war in Ukraine. These are reasons that we need to have energy independent, not necessarily independent, but energy security for our nation using clean energy. Just throw up the org chart for you so you can see how things fit in. But uh, our lab director is John Wagner. He worked at Oak Ridge before he came to INL and he's a Penn State graduate. Uh, he is a nuclear engineer. Um, we have two deputy lab directors, me and Juan Alvarez. We have five uh, associate laboratory directors who handle the technical parts of the laboratory. And then, of course, we have lots of functions like security and business management and safety and all those types of things as well. But we uh, are about 5,400 people at our laboratory. We have about a 1.5 to 1.6 billion dollar operating budget each year. And on this slide, you can see how we fit into the state of Idaho. So over here is how the state of Idaho and this little sort of backwards Idaho little thing is, is up in this corner of the Eastern part of Idaho and the main part, so there's basically two parts to INL. One is what we call the site. And I'll give you a little tour of that next if the movie works. And then the other part is here on, uh, about 45 minutes east of the materials and fuels complex, we have our research and education campus, which is in the city of Idaho Falls. So we have a, about half of our workforce works out on the site, primarily in the materials and fuels complex, at the advanced test reactor complex, and up here at the specific manufacturing capability, which is where we make tank armor for the Army. This is sort of a historical function that we've done for them for many years. It's a little bit different from some of our other activities. So every national laboratory has a large variety of activities. Also on our site, we have a naval reactors facility. We have radioactive waste management complex. And we also have a large critical infrastructure test range complex that we use for that type of work. As you might imagine, uh, when we were the National Reactor Testing Station, uh, we developed a lot of test reactors. 52, actually, over the time period, almost all in the, between 1950 and 1970-ish. We, we operate four today, two at the advanced test reactor site, uh, one at the materials, at, oh, two at the materials and drill complex, one is which is uh, MRAD is our trigger reactor that we use uh, associated with PIE post reaction examination, and then we also have the treat reactor, which does transient testing. The advanced test reactor is the world's largest thermal uh, radiation test reactor. It has a capability of 250 megawatts. Its primary purpose is to test fuels for the Navy, but we also do a, a fair amount of science with that. And you can see the other numbers here on the screen. For reactors, we have all these radiological facilities. 
we have three fire stations, we have um, you know, high voltage transmission lines. We have a grid that we can actually decouple from the, the main you know, electric grid and run experiments on a completely enclosed grid and a lot of really fun stuff. What else happens on this site? We also have, as you might imagine from those 48 reactors that are no longer operating, they all produce spent fuel. So we have to, that has to be managed and that is managed on various areas such as the this Idaho Nuclear Technology and Engineering Center we call Intech, and the Radioactive Waste Management Complex. And there's a whole nother group of people who work for an environmental contractor that's separate from our lab who handle that. So at our laboratory, we do not, we do, not do the functions of managing that, uh, the spent fuel from those reactors specifically. We work on the research and development aspects, uh, which is much more fun. Okay, so 890 square miles, that's almost the size of Rhode Island. Okay, so let's see if this works. I don't know if it's gonna work or not. Oh yeah, let's try it. I'm, I'm going to try to give you a, a visual tour of INL. See if it, okay, so this is our research and education campus. We have buildings related to our national security work. This is an energy building. This is our energy systems laboratory. Um, Center for Advanced Energy Studies. This is a cyber core integration center. That's the Snake River in the background. So as you can see, we have a variety of fairly modern buildings on our Idaho Falls campus. And this was, must have been taken before it got too hot because things are pretty green. Okay, now we are moving out to the site. We have a fleet of 79 buses that take employees out to the site every day because it's 45 to minutes to an hour away. So you, we just went past the sign going into the, into the area and now we're at the materials and fuels complex. This, this silver dome represents the old EBR2 reactor. And there, it is going to be repurposed, it's in the process of that for micro reactor demonstrations. And uh, this is the hot fuel examination facility, which has an absolutely enormous hot cell, argon hot cell in there that has not been entered since 1975. And uh, just, I got, I got lost, we missed a few of the exciting things about uh, NFC, sorry. So now we're looking at the critical infrastructure test range where we look, we do work related to things like grid security. And now we're out at the advanced reactor test complex. So the ATR itself is this building back here, it takes about 500 employees to run the advanced test reactor. And it's a, a major, major facility for the DOE. This is a specific manufacturing capability up in the north part of the site where we make the tank armor. So as you can see, it's a very large area. It's a pretty dry place. Uh, in, this, in the winter time, it is covered with snow. Okay, but the big thing here is that we have a pretty unique uh, amount of real estate and unique facilities that enable us to take things that you can develop within the laboratory and on your computer and demonstrate them at scale. And I think that, that is something that's fairly unique about Idaho. Okay, moving on. Oops, how do I get out of this? Let's try this. Okay, there we go. Okay, so now let's go on to the actual, hopefully, science part of this. So what we're trying to do here at Idaho National Laboratory is help the nation develop a low carbon energy future. We are very much supported by our current administration with regards to nuclear power being a critical part of the decarbonization equation. What we want to do with, with new nuclear is to put it together into an integrated energy systems paradigm where it takes a large variety of different low carbon energy sources, both base load and intermittent, and we use both the heat and the electricity from those to do everything, to create the electricity we need for the environment, but also to create heat and turn it into hydrogen, maybe desalinate water, do all sorts of create chemicals and do this in an integrated way. We feel this is the way that we should be doing energy in the future in the country. So we have uh, created five different strategic initiatives at IML in order to try to make that help make that happen. And they're all focused around the clean energy future that you see in the middle. And it's a clean and secure energy future. So we have two related to nuclear reactors and integrated fuel cycle solutions. So two nuclear focused 
strategic initiatives that support our integrated energy systems uh, in a triangle, essentially way. So we're trying all focus on the clean energy future through those initiatives, and we support it through advanced materials and manufacturing for clean environments. And, and everything is surrounded by our secure and resilient cyber physical systems initiative because we need to make everything secure for the future. So that is the basic fundamental thing of what INL is about. So let's, now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about those things and hopefully areas that you might be interested in. So we'll start with our nuclear reactor sustainment and expanded deployment initiative. It has three elements. The first thing is to strengthen our commercial enterprise in the United States, our power reactor fleet. They're there, they're creating 20% of the nation's electricity, about half of the carbon uh, free power that we produce every day is produced by nuclear. So we got to keep this going. So we're doing that in a variety of ways. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. You're also trying to enable US technological leadership in global energy markets. Very important for the United States to exert leadership. We really want Russia and China to be building all the nuclear reactors worldwide. Shouldn't they be using nuclear, American nuclear technology? That, and we have great regulatory uh, controls here in the US too that make sure that these uh, systems are safe. So, and it also provides us with the leadership we need for the non-proliferation regime across the world. So we can't neglect that. And then finally, the last part of this is expanding and deploying our national nuclear energy strategic infrastructures. And so I'll talk for a minute about that. Along the bottom of this slide, we have core capabilities symbols uh, that we use for the Department of Energy that rep so that represents which one of those uh, contribute to this particular strategic initiative. We need not be too worried about those for the purposes of this talk, but that's what they are. Okay, let's, let's talk a little bit more about strengthening the domestic commercial nuclear enterprise. So I'll talk about three different elements of that. First is piloting integrated operations concepts for light water reactors. And that's a picture of our human system simulation laboratory that we have at INL. And there's a lot more of it around the corner there that you can't see, that allows us to um, you know, duplicate the control rooms and other aspects for a variety of different types of, of reactors. But what we do there is a rather large program that some of you, many of you may be familiar with called Light Water Reactor Sustainability Program from the Department of Energy and Nuclear Energy, where we're looking at how can we make the current fleet more economic. You know, the security costs that we've had, particularly since 9-11, and the low cost of natural gas has put a lot of economic pressure on the current fleet. So how can we use new technology and we've done things like piloting uh, using drones to do routine inspections and flying them around the plants and you know, capturing QR codes. And there is a lot of different types of, of operational things that we can use to try to make our current fleet more economically sustainable. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do to strengthen our current enterprise. Secondly, we're, divesting, we're developing and testing accident tolerant fuel concepts. This became very important after the Fukushima accident. And it's also not just accident tolerant characteristics, but also higher burn-ups for current, the current scene. And then thir thirdly, uh, DOE has been invested hundreds of millions of dollars into the TRISO fuel particles, and INL has been uh, involved with all aspects of that. And so we're enabling that commercial supply chain. Very important for the next generation of micro reactors that we hope to see coming up soon, which I believe that's not quite my next slide. Okay, so the next the next uh, topic is the global technological leadership. So we're looking at things like fission bat. We believe call fission battery systems. How can we make nuclear systems so small and so automatic and easy to use that people think about them as batteries? That would be a great outcome. Uh, we are working on advanced reactors, and uh, there you see one of our staff members, Yasser Arafat, who is uh, has ties to North Carolina State, and he is working with our, our the Marvel reactor that we are developing with DOE money right now. I'll have a slide on Marvel here in a second, but it's a very small reactor we're developing ourselves. It would be the first one in decades that is actually gone, going critical at INL that would be new technology. Another thing we're doing is advancing 
fundamental science. We're working with the DOE Office of Science on materials and chemistry work that will help us um, you know, continue the journey that we need to develop new nuclear systems. And finally, we're really trying to bring digital engineering concepts into nuclear as well. So there are, you know, we're not the only people who are doing these things, but we're trying to do all of them at INL. Next, let's talk a little bit about advanced reactive demonstration deployments. This is my boss's favorite slide, John Wagner, director of INL. He created, you know, this timeline thing. Everybody says, oh, you're crazy about these dates that you've got here on the slide. And I will say that we cannot control all of the dates on these weeks. Many of them are dependent upon industrial partners. But one we can control is Marvel. This is a very small micro reactor that we are building with DOE money. Not very much. I believe we've got $20 million this year to, to work on Marvel. The idea of it being critical, probably not at the end of 2023, but probably sometime first quarter of calendar year 2024. We have, uh, we're doing a variety of microreactor demonstrations. Project Pele is being funded by the Department of Defense with the idea of a microreactor for forward operating bases and deployment for national security situations has to be fully transportable. So you see the idea you can build it in a factory, put it into a truck, take it out to, or put it onto an airplane and take it out to a, a military installation. That's going to be demonstrated in our dome test bed, which is the old EBR2 dome, which is being repurposed to do micro reactor demonstrations. So that's going to happen within a few years. And then we are also working on this molten chloride reactor experiment, which is a molten salt uh, fueled uh, critical experiment being put together by Southern Company and Terra Power. And that will be uh, demonstrated in this Lotus test bed uh, that we are also, also at our site. And then these other things show other industrial uh, reactor concepts that are being developed and will be tested, not all at INL, but we have roles in all these because most of them are funded by the uh, Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program of the Department of Energy. So let's see if I can remember who's going to go where. I know Natrium is going to be going into the site of the retiring coal plant in Wyoming. So this is in, in Kemmer, Wyoming, and it's going to be a fast spectrum reactor that has with, with salt with salt storage at the same site. What's exciting about that, of course, is the fact that we could take the distribution lines for the electricity from a, that are already in place for the coal for the coal mine and repurpose them for new nuclear energy that is being, uh, that it will be developed. I think XC, XC100 from X Energy High Temperature Gas Reactor is going to go in, in Washington State, I believe that's where that one is, going to be demonstrated. And then Hermes, uh, right now, some of them that need to find where coverage is going to be demonstrated there. These are not micro reactors, these are more small modular reactors. But we're very excited about the entire micro reactor spectrum when we're talking about very, very small reactors that could be used to promote to power, say, remote mines or small remote communities or microgrids powered by a micro reactor. And so we're working very hard on those concepts. And then finally, over here in 2029, we've got the Voyager reactor, which is this new scale uh, PWR design which has uh, you know, been going through the NRC licensing process, and that one will be built on the INL site. And so all, some of these dates, we don't know what will happen with all of them, but as you can see, there's just a lot of things happening. We're involved in all these projects, and we are very, very excited about the future of nuclear energy based on these types of these projects. And these are specific real projects. So just a few words about Marvel. Many of you may know something about this, but it is a 100 kilowatt thermal, 20 kilowatt electric, a micro reactor. It's only about 12 feet tall, I believe. And it's, uh, we're trying to do this to, on a rapid development cycle, being built completely at INL to provide experience with, with solving the problems we need to make a new reactor actually work and get it going. So we're currently, uh, working with a lot of different people. It's gonna use four Stirling engines. It is uh, based on the 
a SNAP 10A cord around the tree using a modified tree to fuel. The fuel was a, it's a long pole in the tent here, and we we're going to make it at INL. And it is, uh, but I think we're on, on the on the road now. We're going to put it into the treat building. So treat's one of our four reactors. It has a it was it's uh, slated to have it's a, got a long complicated history, but basically it's got a building that has some room in it because it was going to expand and then they decided to shut it down. So it, we've got room for this uh, for the marble reactor in the treat building. And you can see the graphics show you where the you know sort of how the size of it and the um, the basics of it and where we're going to put it. That stuff is no longer in that cell. It's empty. So we're very excited about this. This is going to happen really soon. Okay, so moving on to the national strategic infrastructure. There are several different points I'd like to make here. We have really extensive post-radiation examination facilities at INL. We've got the popular examination facility for normal scale, mesoscale uh, examination. We've got the radiation, radiating materials characterization lab, which has a variety of, uh, you know, very fine scale equipment, you know, focus ion beams to cut samples so that you can cut hot samples with these things are all under shielding. We can do SEM, we can do TEM, we can do atom probe, we can do X-ray tomography. If Ben can tell us more about, much more about what all the uh, capabilities that we have at IMCL. But then we're finally building out the third leg of the triad, which is this, what we're calling the sample prep lab, which is, I think, a really bad name. So what I'm really hoping is that we'll be able to come up with a new name for the, for SPL that does not sample prep lab, but actually keeps the SPL um, letters because everybody's been calling it SPL for years. But this is a line item. Uh, this is, uh, I think, an actual photo of the outside of it, so not even a mock-up, we've created the outside. We're building new uh, hot cell facilities in there to do structural material examination. Uh, for, so that creates the third leg of the triad. So we've got the, the nuclear materials of PIE and we'll be able to do structural materials as well in that building. And that's going to be the, uh, largely, it's not completely be done in fiscal 23 or calendar 23, but in 24. We have retrofitted the uh, advanced test reactor top head closure plates so that we can uh, expand our capabilities and replicate some of the things that were lost when the Halden reactor closed in Norway. And so this that's the new top head closure plate for ATR. We are establishing these test beds. We talked about, I mentioned the, the big dome that we have and also this Lotus test bed, which will be smaller, but enable us to use be in a security environment. So if we have plutonium fuels that we're or high, highly enriched uranium fuels that we need to ma manage with, that we can use those. And then finally, we have this uh, co computing and modeling and simulation framework we call MOOSE, which is widely used across the, um, the nuclear reactor um, you know, ecosystem. And uh, we're very proud that we continue to expand MOOSE with new capability. So that, those are the, what we're doing in those areas. So let's move on to the integrated fuel cycles solution. Obviously, the reactor is the middle part of the fuel cycle. We've got the front end, we've got the back end. So this strategic initiative covers those two things, those two aspects. We want to make sure that we have the right type of fuel capability for these new micro reactors. Most of these are going to use high SA low enriched uranium or HALU, right? We don't have a way to make HALU in the US. So what are we going to do about that? I'll talk, talk about that in a second. Also managing radiological waste materials, uh, reducing proliferation risk as part of integrated fuel cycle solutions. And then we've got some test beds for that as well. So uh, our fuel cycle people stole the timeline uh, thing and made it more complicated. But what are we doing? How can we make our HALU work in the US? This is, this is tough. But what we're, one of the things that we're doing at INL in order to try to jumpstart it before we have a domestic capability, because we have no domestic enrichment capability for HALU right now, but we're working on it. So what can we do to jumpstart those microreactors that are going to use HALU by providing them with feedstock for that? So what we're doing is we are, electro 
uh, refining and pulling processing the EBR2 origin uh, fuel. So we have spent fuel from the EBR2, and we are working uh, 12 hours a day, seven days a week in our fuel conditioning facility to pull the uranium out of it and then down blend it to about 20% and create a seed stock for the HALU that com companies can use. We've made about a metric ton of that so far, and we, we have eventually about 12 metric tons available of that to use for various uh, companies. We're also working on a, a project or a, a technique called Xersex, which we're, where we could take aluminum clad fuel and pull the cladding off. We've demonstrated that uh, initial, done some initial demonstrations so that you could take different types of clad fuel and then also be able to generate feedstock. We've done some polishing of some of these fuel ingots because not when, for example, the EBR2 process doesn't make beautiful, you know, purity halo. So we have to do some additional refining for it. So this is, we have a whole plan to support this new reactor industry by providing feedstock to jumpstart their economy. And then eventually, though, we need to have a domestic enrichment capability. And of course, that is a big investment by industry, right? So how are we going to get industry to invest in making the fuel we need for the new reactors before the new reactors are built? It's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. And so that we're trying to do our part. With regards to the RDD test beds, we we're building a MISTIC, the molten salt thermophysical examination capabilities. This is a glove box line. So we're going to be able to get needed thermal and physical characteristics of molten salts. So molten salt reactor concepts are all over the place, but we don't have all the data we need. And so this is what we're doing for that. We're doing some other things with regards to um, non-proliferation test beds. Moran works on depleted uranium and uh, Veritooth is gonna be available for uh, SNM related fuels, so we're building those. And then also this geomelt unit we have here is uh, creating uh, waste forms, uh, sodium-based waste and turning them into a glass form. And so the, doing R&D on all these, creating these infrastructures so we can do the R&D to enable the fuel cycles for the next generation of nuclear. So let's move on since I've uh, moving through my time rather quickly. Uh, integrated energy systems. So this is really the holy grail. We want to use nuclear to create integrated energy systems that will be the how we do energy in the future in this nation. So what? What? But that's a huge problem. A lot of people are working on. We're working very closely with NREL, the Renewable Energy Lab, and with NETL, the Fossil Energy Lab, on different parts of this. So what's part of the uh, integrated energy systems ecosystem is INL working on? Well, we are working on the nuclear part, but also we're working on the thermal part. So NREL is typically focuses very much on the electricity sector, but there's a whole part, many of our carbon emissions come from things like making concrete, making ammonia, uh, making hydrogen. That's usually done by, you know, steam gas, the steam reforming of methane, right? So, so there's carbon emissions with all these industrial processes. And of course, nuclear creates heat. So why can't we use heat for nuclear to drive some of these processes? And for some of that, you might need higher temperature outlet reactors, but we're working on those, right? So conceptually, this should all, could all come together. And so we're, those are the points we're working on for uh, integrated energy systems in the thermal part, the nuclear part, and then with regards to hydrogen, we're working on uh, high temperature electrolysis as our niche. So this is just the 50,000 foot shifting the energy paradigm slide. So talking about how we would take nuclear there on the left with other generation, you know, and many of which only produce electricity, things like the wind power that can produce thermal, produces electricity, right? We put them all together and, and this could conclude, uh, could include municipal solid waste use that you could include carbon capture and sequestration of natural gas because we're not getting, you know, we're still 80% fossil fuel in this country. So it's probably not going to go away anytime soon. So but we're going to have to capture carbon. Put that in together, use the, the heat 
and the electrons, but also coupled to storage. Very important. We have to have grid scale storage, another holy grail part of this energy equation. And we're working on that as well to do to produce all of these various things, you know, desalinate water, create some fuels, perhaps obviously create the electricity, and then you know, fuel cells for, for transportation. One of our uh, things that we're hoping to do at INL, and I'll talk about this right at the end, is that we've actually made a commitment to try to go net zero for our site by 2031. Well, I mentioned we had 79 buses. So they run, uh, how, how do we make those zero emissions, right? Could we create hydrogen fuel cell buses? These are, by the way, these are big coach buses. Sort of like, uh, not like that, that's a city bus type of thing. We have the big Greyhound type buses at INL. And so they don't they actually hydrogen fuel cell coaches don't exist yet. So how do we, how do we do that? So we're involved in all these types of things. And to do that, uh, to help demonstrate some of these things, we've created an integrated energy systems lab, which is in our energy systems laboratory building, high bay building. And since uh, just in the last three years or so, this building has really changed and filled up with all of this really cool equipment that you can see here on the slide. So we've got a high temperature electrolysis unit. That one's about 25 kilowatts, and we've got a 100 kilowatt one outside that we are currently producing hydrogen, where that was uh, purchased to us by, um, uh, we're doing that work for Bloom Energy. We've created uh, a non nuclear. Uh, reactor essentially to provide heat to put into the system. We've got a thermal energy storage system, a thermal energy distribution system. We've got digital real time grid simulations so we can figure out, you know, in hardware and the loop types of things, how we can, how we would affect the grid, emulate the power. We also do a lot of battery uh, testing and work with high speed battery charging for electric vehicles, wireless charging. And of course, we, we talked about the human system simulation laboratory uh, prior. So we have put together all these components so that we can start testing and designing actual small scale integrated energy systems. Because it's simple in concept, right? I'm going to use the heat, I'm going to use the electricity, I'm going to do all this stuff. How do you actually make that happen? These, these are the types of uh, work that you need to do in order to be, make that a reality. And uh, hydrogen production is a big deal. And so we are, and I mentioned we're working on hydrogen, uh, high temperature hydrogen particularly, but we're also working on using nuclear to create, to create hydrogen. And we're doing that with commercial plants. And a couple of these are going to be just sort of plug and play uh, with low temperature electrolysis. And that's the nine mile uh, plant demo. And then the one with Davis Bessie, those are both going to be sort of standard, but then with the, these plants uh, in the middle, we'll be doing, uh, the idea is to eventually be doing high temperature electrolysis uh, with nuclear as well. And I won't go into any detail here due to time. So moving in along, so that's sort of the holy grail part. And how we support that, we're doing that with our advanced materials and manufacturing initiative. And so a, a variety of different things that, that we do and a big focus on our digital engineering here. We are doing some, we do uh, you know, 3D printing at, at, at INL, but we're not the 3D printing lab. If you wanna, if you wanna talk about you know, additive manufacturing in national laboratories, you generally think about Oak Ridge. They have a huge effort doing that. What we're trying to do is look at Focusing on the extreme environments, such as you would find in a nuclear plant, uh, on those processes, not and certainly using additive where it's appropriate to use it, but also use other types of manufacturing techniques and and uh, incorporating the digital design. So, here's some examples of some of the advanced materials and manufacturing that we've been using. So we we have actually printed some fuel. That's the uh, one up on the top from the powder feedstock, and also working on uh, fuels for NASA. Um, and then we've we've also working on things like you know advanced survivability and lightweight materials. And we're working with a particular technology, which you can see up here on the right, electric field-assisted sintering, which is a very high current, low voltage 
sintering process that can speed up uh, sintering processes for certain materials. And this particular uh, thing has a three foot by three foot uh, uh, available area. So EFAS sint uh, sintering has been around for a long time, but it's always been in very small uh, aerial quantities. So we can see uh, this large scale, we just got this um, up and running very, very recently. And so it's the largest facility of its kind in the world, and it can reduce the time that's needed to center materials by, uh, by a order of magnitude, essentially, for certain, for certain materials. Um, so let's see. So that's basically, and, and we mentioned survivable materials and kinetic environments, so that gets to some of the national security stuff that we do at the laboratory as well. So then let's move on to the final one and I'll wrap up. Uh, secure and resilient cyber physical systems. So we've got all these great energy systems. How do we make sure that they're not hacked into, that we can't be uh, disturbed? And we are all very concerned about cyber attacks. We know they're real, um, they've happened. How can we make sure that they don't happen uh, to us in the, in the future. So one thing, the elements of this is that we are, we've developed methodologies to, to cyber inform engineering from the beginning. And we've published materials on this and we're working with companies on how to adapt these methodologies. So we don't say, okay, I'm gonna create this, this mechanical system, mechanical and electrical system. And then, oh yeah, I gotta worry about the cyber security part later. And then realize that they might have designed it Poorly for that for that purpose. So how can we build this in from the front? And we have ways that we've determined how to do that. Uh, we also work on uh, physical and cyber critical infrastructure resilience is a big deal. Resilience, of course, being a, sort of a major buzzword these days. But the, the sweet spot at INL in this area is control system cybersecurity. We have a very significant capability in that area, and we apply it to nuclear as well as to other. Um, uh, other, you know, many other uh, applications. And then wireless communications is another area that we work on quite a bit. So we are involved in the SIMANI program, which is a DOE uh, advanced manufacturing uh, program, which is led on the uh, University of Texas San Antonio. And it's all about uh, control system security for the digital supply chain and for for advanced manufacturing automation. So that's a big part of our effort here in resiliency. We have created, we actually wrote, so our name isn't on it because I never do this with DOE, but the National Cyber Informed Engineering Strategy was just published in June and was led by INL. And we also do a lot of training with utilities where we bring people in and train them on how to react to and, and uh, protect their their infrastructure from cyber attacks. We also, you know, focus a lot on national security. So securing wireless communications, we work in the 5G spectrum. We're starting to look at 6G. We have a 5G wireless security test bed. Uh, we have created a lot of, you know, oops, sorry. I knew I was going to do that. I told you three before I started to talk that I would make one mistake. I was going to submit three and slide advancement. So I waited till the end to do it today. Uh, but we do a lot of, you know, sort of board level things that help you can put bolt on to. This is not, you know, building it in from the beginning, but there's a lot of systems that are out there and they've got vulnerabilities. So how, what can we do about that? You can take some of these uh, systems like this constrained cyber communication device and help uh, you know, existing systems detect and then uh, allow people to react and defend against the cyber attack. So, and then we've also uh, create threat assessments and intelligence assessments and analyses for the uh, Department of Energy and other customers. So that's a very, uh, you know, 90 miles an hour type of tour of what INL does. And I'll end with our with our net zero. So we are trying to lead by example. We think of the national lab system that if we want the country to go to no carbon emissions, that's why not us, right? So we signed up with four other national laboratories to pilot. And I will say we're the leader on this. 
to pilot net zero, and we committed to try to do this by 2031. And you can see some of the challenges that we have. We use about 30 or 40 megawatts of power a year. We've got, oh, 50, it says, but I don't think it's quite that. I actually think I'm close to it. It's still a significant amount of energy. We have more than 600 vehicles. We've got a lot of employees. And we've got a lot of buildings. So how are we going to do all this? Well, there's a lot of things. Of course, we're starting with the low-hanging fruit, and we're trying to do things like figure out how we can convert our uh, vehicle fleet to electric. We've got a landfill that we didn't really know what the emissions from the landfill were, so we're monitoring them to see if we can take credit for, for those or not, or if we have to do something there. So we're doing a lot of the simple things first. And then our vision is to create a net zero microgrid. So here you would have various types. We could drill a geothermal well. Of course, we want to have a micro reactor involved in this. Timing is, is everything uh, for that in terms of getting these things uh, implemented and bring and create our own integrated energy system for the laboratory that will enable us to go to net zero and all these five different strategic initiatives that we have at the laboratory are going to help us get there. So that's... Uh, that's not the last one. Here is the last one. Because we are work here at a university, I wanted to mention workforce. So we are continually growing. So we have uh, about 5,400 employees. Right now, we are intend to uh, continue. This is actually, I think it's full-time equivalence, but we're continually growing. We're interested in hiring people with great skills like yourselves. Uh, we work with a lot of universities, but NC State is one of the most important ones to us. We're part of our National University Consortium, which has five schools. And we are uh, we have a significant intern program in fiscal 21. It was 471, but we had about 500 this year in fiscal 22. We're very happy to have people back on site after a few years of having to do our intern program remote. And we are continuing to grow our postdoc program as well. When I arrived at INL in 2019, we had about 35 postdocs, which is not very many. Most national laboratories have a lot more. We are now up to about 100, and we are continuing to develop our postdoc population. And we have lots of opportunities for, for new PhDs to come out and work with us. So I'm pretty sure that's my last slide. It is. So with that, I thank you for your Anybody have any questions? Okay, so we got two sets of questions. We have, we have people here and then we have people online. So I'm going to monitor. Mm -hmm. Great. You're on behind me to monitor this one. If you're online and you have questions, please raise your hand or post your question to the chat and I can read it. Um, but we'll, for, as I get that set up, we'll start with any questions we have in here. Okay. Go Oh, go ahead. I um, I don't know much about energy at this point. I'm brand new, but I, I work in industry. There's tons and tons and tons of billions of dollars going into cybersecurity explicitly at this moment. Yes. Um, you mentioned you have a strong focus there. Can, can you suggest where the national labs are approaching things that the market is not more broadly? Well, we actually we work very closely with industry, but we're able to. With our test range, one of the things we can do is demonstrate the concepts in a real way. So we can take things and do cyber attacks on physical objects without, yes, we can, without um, you know, creating a mess or, or impacting the electric grid. So we, can, we have our own, we can take, uh, actually just this year we were, um, created, we finished the, a new high power line so we actually can detach the grid from our, you know, our own test system from the grid without any, you know, impacts on anybody else. So that's one thing that we can do. We also have access to a lot of, we do a lot of classified work on this, on these topics in terms of, you know, understanding what the threats and vulnerabilities are, and then we can work with industry, people in industry who have clearances to help educate them of what we understand the, the threats are to the systems. With the timeline of the electric building, I'm assuming that INL is going to be involved in their operations at some point and testing whatever programs around them. 
we have a similar timeline for the growth in the, um, the work. Yes. Well, we have done quite a bit of analysis on our workforce needs, and it's very complicated because uh, you know there's there's a variety of different types of people that we will need to do this. You know, obviously we need scientists and engineers, but we we'll also need craft workers and construction workers, and uh, a lot of um, you know, a lot of support people. And then we have significant uncertainty with regards to funding and when it occurs. Because we are subject to, to U.S. government appropriations and we only can work with the amount of money that we have. So it is a little bit of a, of a treacherous, you know, thing you can over hire and then, and then not, or you can under hire and not have enough people. So we are trying to approach this very mindfully and we are uh, growing basically as fast as we can provide funding for people who, you know, that we can hire. But that does, of course, you know, there is some risk involved in doing that if, if funding does not appear or if these projects collapse. But right now we are, I think we've got uh, good plans and we intend to grow significantly. Say in the next decade, everything pans out until 2029. Do you think that will have a couple? I don't know. I'm not sure I'm willing to go on record. <laughs> 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 I'm okay. Okay. Uh, more questions from either our in person attendees or like I said, if anyone's online who'd like to post a question, we got one actually, we got one here. All right, <clears throat> so uh, uh. Amos, one of our online participants asks, uh, are high temperature graphite moderated reactors being figured into the advanced reactor development efforts? I already said I wasn't a nuclear engineer. <laughs> I'm not sure about- Don't, don't kill the messenger. I'm just- Yeah, I'm not sure about the graphite moderated part, but obviously there's a lot of high temperature concepts that are moving forward. Okay, uh, any questions here or online, please continue to post or raise hand online or raise hand here. Ah, the timeline for that. So let's see, what, what can I say about this? Um, we are, the U.S. is a little bit behind Europe in high temperature electrolysis. So we have only a few companies. We're working primarily with Bloom Energy on their products. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're in the pretty early stages, I would say. I, I, we've got this 100 kilowatt uh, unit that we're testing right now at INL. And I believe we are expecting to get a 250 kilowatt unit, but we need to get up to this 5 to 10 megawatt range to be commercially viable. So it, not next year for that, right? It's going to take a while. So that this is an area where the U.S. is not leading. But we do think that we have got some good indication that it can be, you know, economical to do it that way if we have the high temperature, you know, if we've got the heat we need to do it. And or we can create the, you know, the system properly. So, yeah. But that's our... Um, you know, that's sort of what we're trying to contribute to the to the electrolysis game. Is a little we consider it to be our niche, but as a high risk. Yeah. Is um, there a research into the synthetic fuel production of integrated? There's been, of course, there's been a lot of synthetic research over the years. Um, we are. I would say that's not a focus for us, but we are, we are we do work with with biomass primarily, not as much as the, you know making fuels out of the, of the components. As much. So I would say that's not one of our main focuses. But I wouldn't say we're going to do anything. You know, like a lot of natural labs, we have a lot of different activities that are not it's hard to keep track of all of them. Yeah. My question is related to your net zero goals. Mm -hmm. Did you have any chance to measure the contribution of energy efficiency to reach out your net zero goals rather than producing energy otherwise? We are working on it. I would say that, you know, we've, 
So, so um, this net zero thing came about about a year ago. And so it was really one of those sort of big vision things from the leadership, specifically my boss, that we should take iron on that zero. And I was like, yeah, it sounds like a great idea. Okay, now how do we do it, right? So the first thing we did was go out and hire a, a net zero director. We, we hired a, a, a nuclear person, John Z. Kambasami, who's for the GE Hitachi. And she's, she's just got the whole pro program plan put together. And it includes things like measuring the efficiency, but we don't really know yet what we're doing. So we are working with on that, but absolutely building efficiency is a huge part of it. Uh, how we will achieve that at INL is another interesting thing because we have, and I'm just speculating here, I mean, we have a lot of uh, older buildings out on our site that are very energy inefficient, right? Don't have good insulation, this sort of thing. In town, the buildings you saw in town look newer, right? There, there are, we don't own them, though. We are leasing all those buildings. So if we're going to make modifications to the lease buildings, that's another volume of legal complexities as well. So yes, building efficiency is important. How are we going to do it? Not sure yet. Stay tuned. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your last slides. Um, I noticed that there seem to be some uh, within the park thank you grid. Grid, are you considering of including some annual life and total electrical energy from the repairs? That's an excellent, excellent point. So, uh, and I didn't mention this when I was zipping through that, but. One of the advantages we have with go, trying to go net zero at INL is that we are already 70% clean electricity. So Idaho Falls power uh, provides power to our facilities in town and it's 100% hydroelectric. So we already use that. Uh, in, uh, the power out of the site is provided by a company called Idaho Power and they have, they purchased some power from coal plants in Utah and Wyoming. So we're not 100% clean there, but I, Idaho as a, as a state uh, is already very heavily hydroelectric. So, so we have that advantage in trying to get to that goal. And yes, absolutely, we want to use all the hydroelectric we can, hopefully, assuming there is water to do it, right? We're also in a big drought. Okay, got time for a couple more questions. Going once, going twice, and going Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks, Dr. Thank Right. <laughs>